In this episode, we're talking with senior economist Paul Ryan from REA Group's PropTech. And we're going to discuss how can it be that prices are rising even though it's well accepted that we have an affordability problem. What does housing unaffordability even mean and how is it measured? And why is it that we have a shortage of housing with declining approvals and yet what is being built is not being built where we want to live? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. Our guest today is Paul Ryan. Paul is a senior economist at REA Group, specializing in housing finance, market forecasting, and big data analysis. And before joining REA in December 2020, He spent a decade at the Reserve Bank of Australia conducting research on the Australian economy, focusing on housing markets, lending risks and regulatory effects on property markets. Paul is based in Sydney and this is the second time we've had the pleasure of his company. Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. Thank you very much for having me again. Paul, thanks so much for coming on on this 38 degree day. I just want to wind you out a bit more, but um, you know, uh, I absolutely love talking to yourselves and Domain and throw them in there straight at the start but um you know it, just because the amount of data you guys get access to and the, the quality of that is just so enticing for someone like myself before we go in a bit of a conversation around affordability and the overall uh picture that rea is sort of seeing i mean what's your take on the how you know the property market in 2023 and coming into 2024 i always like as an economist to, to sort of see what you guys are thinking under the hood yeah, um, it's been, I mean, it's been a few years of um, very interesting um, property market occurrences, um, but we, we started the year very, very slow in terms of uh, particularly activity. Um, so we came out of the second half of 2022, uh, prices falling quite persistently and, and prices falling quite persistently, particularly the top end of the market. We saw um, Sydney and Melbourne seeing declining prices. Um, I think uh, this time last year, um, prices in Sydney were down 6.4% over the prior 12 months. Um, and particularly in, in the more affluent parts of the market. So we saw, I think, a really persistent trend where um, the most expensive regions were seeing the biggest falls. And that seemed to be consistent with really um, constrained borrowing capacities as the Reserve Bank raised rates at the fastest rate on, in, on record. Then we came into 2023 and, and, and things started to change. They started to change in prices first. So we saw um, in Sydney prices start to rise in January, and, and we actually saw prices rise every every month this year. Um, and then it wasn't until kind of May in Sydney that that activity started to take off, and, and activity picked up in Melbourne at the same kind of time. So we've seen kind of a, a year of two halves. The first year, first half of the year, slow activity. Second half of the year, actually quite solid activity. And in Sydney and Melbourne, we actually saw uh, more activity in August uh, in 2023 than we saw in 2021, which was you know, the biggest year for transactions in, in a decade. Yeah, and that's what you mean by activity Yeah, being transactions. So properties transactions, sorry, selling, yes. transacting, yes. Prices can rise and activity can be low or vice versa, I guess. And that's um, what we're seeing at the start of the year is, yeah. is rising prices, but but people not listing properties, people not transacting. Uh, and do you think, why, why you talk about activity there? Is it, is it, you know, at REA, I reckon activity and listing numbers matter a lot, right? Like that's your revenue stream. Um, and- you know, I guess when you look at longer term trends around listing numbers and turnover rates and, you know, and all, like when I look at your housing report, my property market outlook report here, you know, uh, total monthly listings are at 10 year low, right? Like how does REA feel around this I mean, on a personal side, but also what do you think is driving this, you know, very low amount of activity that's decade lows? Uh, obviously, at, at REA Group, we care a lot about um, about turnover um, because it's important for our, our financial performance. But um, and, and if we take a step back as a, as a housing economist, um, turnover um, is one of those things that signifies that households are, are doing something right. Um, when when households um, sell properties and and move home, 
Um, it's for a number of reasons. And we've seen over the past decade that that people are less likely to sell homes and and upgrade or sell homes for for whatever reason. So um, there's a number of reasons for that, and and um, I think one of them is transaction costs. Stamp duty has become a bigger burden as prices have increased. Uh, so it, I mean that's a simple that's simple incentive structure there. <laughs> um, it's it's much more expensive to transact property than it used to be. Um, the other one um, is demographics. Uh, people tend to transact properties when they're in the prime of their lives. Um, you get, you know, this um, housing upgrade cycle. So people buy homes when they're, you know, starting a young family. Um, they outgrow the house. Um, their incomes rise as they kind of come into those prime working years, and they move into bigger homes. And then, ideally, if it's not too expensive, um, kids move out of the home. They sell their large home and move into something that's, um, you know, more appropriate for their twilight years. Um, so as demographics shift in Australia, we kind of expect as people age, uh, maybe a bit less um, turnover. Uh, it's it's hard to kind of disentangle all of those all of those pieces. Um, but do you think people are doing that though? Like, do you think that that oh, dream of hey, I'm going to get this apartment, I'm going to buy a house, and I'm going to get a bigger house, and then I'm going to get the house with the view, and then I'm going to get the house with the view and the pool, and you know, then I'm going to downsize, and I'm going to get this. Do you think that that dream is dead to to some extent at REA? Like, do you think that that ability to do that with transaction costs and borrowing capacities and the affordability and the the mortgage that it costs to do that, um, that people are actually forced to, even the demographics should say, hey, I'm at an age where my kids are bigger and I need more space, but we've got to make it work now in a three bed house um, because we and that's just the, all we can afford. I, I think it's increasingly difficult. Um, so there is a very clear trend that people are buying their first home and getting into home ownership later. Um, now, is that is that housing affordability? I would suggest that that's a big part of it. Um, but we also have seen um, culture change. You know, pe- more people go to university than they used to. People get married later. People have children later. Um, all of these are intertwined. Um, part of that, you know, people people having kids later is partly because. Houses are more of, of, um, unaffordable, yeah. But partly, it's just a, cu- a cultural shift that's happened. Um, so, yeah, if, if people are getting into the housing market later, there's just naturally less of that um, stepping up and stepping down um, throughout throughout time. The difficult question is like, what's normal housing turnover? Um, we we often look back to say the early 2000s, for instance. Um, there was a lot of housing turnover then. But that also followed a lot of financial deregulation that opened up credit to a lot more people, um, particularly second earners and um, you know women, for instance. There was a period where women of childbearing ages weren't lent money because uh, banks said, you know, you're gonna you're gonna leave the workforce and have have a child, uh, and so that changed, and so people could um, borrow more money, and that supported uh, people basically moving into the homes that they wanted to be in. Um, and that maybe was just a temporary boost. So it's hard to get a a, a feel for. What what is the kind of what's the 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 new normal or uh, mm. since those changes? It's interesting because you hear a lot of very simplistic uh, explanations, for, you know, for where why we are where we are, and I and I love sort of you bringing in the nuances here and talking about demographics, but also talking about affordability and talking about you know the the change in 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 societal changes in terms of our you know how we how we partner up when we have children and who's allowed to borrow money and how many incomes are actually contributing towards the family home, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know, I once heard Alan Kohler say that the reason housing is, is expensive in Australia is not because it's unaffordable, it's actually precisely because people can afford it that make it uh, expensive. So what would be your take on that? So there's an aspect to that. I mean, if, if we look across countries, um, housing looks very, very expensive in Australia um, compared to elsewhere. Hey. Um, and that's partly because Australians are one of the the wealthiest, highest income um, societies in the world. Um, we had we had until um, the COVID nineteen pandemic avoided recession uh, for um, the longest run of history than e- than any country. We set a record um, just before just before the pandemic. Um, Australia has had a very long run of prosperity, and living standards have risen um, quite rapidly in Australia. Um, Geographies matter for that, obviously, as well. Um, you know, Australia is a large company, a country, uh, but we can't actually build, or we don't build, in in very much of the of the country. So, and, and our cities tend to be geographically constrained. Sydney, for instance, uh, by water and mountains. Um, 
these things all matter. Um, households have beat up prices um, because they're optimistic about the future and because incomes are high. Um, but it is still the case that if we had more homes, if we built more homes, if we densified our cities, um, housing would be you know more available and more affordable. That's that's the reality here. Is is people are bidding for what is a scarce resource in our country. I think there will always be certain types of housing that will be scarce. You know what I mean? If if we go for density and upzoning, then we're going to have lots and lots of you know small apartments, and that won't make the house any less desirable. In fact, it'll probably make it even more desirable. So. And it'd be interesting to see how that all plans out. But you sort of touched on something there about Australia being one of the most expensive countries in the world for housing. Um, and there are a number of different ways to measure affordability and to, to make that calculation. Can you sort of give us the insights as as to, you know, it, it's it's often commented and I would say that I'm guessing there's not one single metric that is that is relied upon by all commentators. And so I'd be keen to understand your insights and what light you can shed on that? How is me- is affordability measured? How is it, you know, on what metric are we one of the most expensive countries in the world to live in? So affordability is one of one of the, the passion projects um, of mine. It's one of, one of the kind of main reasons I kind of jumped into housing specifically. Um, and we actually released um, this year our, our inaugural prop track housing affordability index. Um, and that's something we developed exactly to answer this question is, how do we think about measuring housing affordability? Um, because I think um, one of the ones that's been used for a long time has been, you know, house prices compared with incomes. Yeah. Um, and I think that has some downsides. And the main downside there is that as interest rates have fallen, um, you expect housing prices to increase as a share of people's income because you can you can support more debt on a given level of income. Um, but also, isn't it? A sort of um, got a flaw in the sense that it is sh- you know if everybody was a first home buyer at it, an account, but because a lot of people are not first home buyers, you know they're buying, they're upgrading, they've got equity that they've had by virtue of growing prices, so it sort of loses its its um, connectivity. You know the correlation to income sort of falls away a bit at that point, doesn't it? Yeah, the the problem is always matching. Um, what you really want to get sense for is you've got some people who want to buy a home and they have some income, and then you've got homes that are for sale and that costs them something. But looking across, you know, if you look at just average incomes or median incomes, um, obviously that's taking in a huge, a, a big group of people, people who are very young, people who are very old and own their home outright. Um, and what you really want to do is narrow in on that that group of buyers. How tough it is it for them? And and measures that, that I think are quite good is, is looking at the burden of um, mortgage serviceability. So how much if you were um, you know a, a prime age worker and you went to buy a typical home, how much of your income would you have to devote to mortgage repayments? Um, that's a good starting point. The index that we, we constructed actually looks at people's incomes all across the spectrum. So across the distribution of incomes. And we basically took, hey, if you're a household with um, a median income, if you're a household with an income at the 80th percentile, um, how many homes that transacted, that sold throughout the year, could you afford to buy um, under you know normal assumptions, um, current mortgage rates, um, a 30-year loan term, um, and what we think a, a, a lender would lend you. And the end result was that is that we actually found that housing affordability in Australia um, in 2022-23, so the last financial year, was was the worst on record, the worst since at least 1995. Um, as as a kind of data point here, what we calculated is if you were a typical household in Australia, you had the median income, uh, you could afford just thirteen percent of all homes that sold over that year. Um, and I think what this tells you is that you're you're exactly right, Veronica. Um, wealth matters hugely for housing in Australia. Uh, people predominantly, even first home buyers, increasingly now um, rely on wealth to get into the market because. The price levels are so high. If we go back to say the the mid nineties, the late nineties, um, things were were more even. Uh, uh, someone at the middle of the income distribution could afford half of all homes that sold, um, and that was you know the, the old um, Joe Hockey remark: um, get a good get a good job and a good income, and you can buy a home. Like that that was what things were like in the the nineteen nineties, um, and things have slowly changed as prices have increased. So interest rates have decreased. That's a really important thing that has boosted borrowing capacities and boosted people's ability to pay. Um, 
But that's meant with higher prices that the deposit burden has become more and more difficult for first-term buyers, but not for upgraders. And and um, to bring it to more recent um, data, we're seeing upgraders make a make up a bigger part of the market this year. And I think that's part of the reason why prices have been so resilient to higher interest rates is that upgraders are less affected by constrained borrowing capacities. So who's buying the upgraders' homes then? Is it downsizers? Because if if you know if it's circular in that way, if you don't have new entrants into the or you've got less new entrants into the into the marketplace, then you know people must be trading within it. Is that fair to say? A little bit. Um, we have seen a pickup in investor activity. Um, investors are kind of back to about a third of new credit. So right. um, despite mortgage rates obviously constraining uh, investor cash flows, um, we've seen rents increase really, really strongly this mm. year. Um, rents are up 15% nationally. Um, I think what we're seeing is, is first-term buyers, are obviously, they're still in the market. Um, and we had a huge bring forward of first-term buyer activity throughout the pandemic. Uh, first-term buyers have pulled back a bit because of these affordability constraints. Investors have kind of taken their place a bit at the bottom end of the market. Uh, and we've seen upgraders um, propping up very much the top end of the market. We're, we're seeing um, you know, the, the expensive parts of Sydney and Melbourne have all have performed well. In Sydney, for instance, you know, the east and north are up 10% in the past 12 months. Paul, yeah. do you think, though, that uh, a bit like climate change, that you know, the worst year of affordability on record is this year. The next year, it's going to be like the worst year of all record of affordability is this year. Like, like ultimately, there's a structural problem, right? And and inequality um, is getting worse and it will get worse because absolutely intergenerational wealth and the baby boomers over the next 10, 15 years are starting to shift that wealth down and not everyone's got that luxury, right? Um, and do you see that, um, you know, affordability metrics that based on someone's income is, is you know, going to really lose its value because it's going to go off the charts, and and because the people entering the market are going to be the people with money that's getting coming down from you know their parents and their grandparents, or people who have already been in the market for some time who are transacting with big deposits. the The first time buyer that's entering the market, you know, typically um, is going to get pushed out um, because it's going to favour people who are cashed up. Yeah, I think. I think that is that's the societal concern here, right? Is um, when you say first home buyers are pushed out, fundamentally you mean pushed out and not able to buy, or they have to wait longer, or they're physically pushed further and further peripheral peripherally in cities. And we see when new suburbs are built very, very far away from from CBDs um, at the moment, um, which is why you know I'm a big fan of of densification. Um, smaller, cheaper homes that are in better locations, they're easier to, to provide services to. Um, they're kind of where first-time buyers want to live. Um, but but yeah, I think this will increasingly become like a political problem. It is who do we want, how, how do we want housing to be owned in the country? Um, and I think Increasingly, even people with a huge amount of housing wealth are recognizing, um, you know, we go, I've, I've talked, I did a, a forum in um, the eastern suburbs of Sydney, a very affluent area, and, you know, people there often own their homes, but they were worried about, you know, where's my child can't live here um, without significant um, input in, in funds. So I think this is becoming, people are recognizing that it, it's not just kind of like, hey, I've got mine, so good luck everyone else. Um, there is a, a broader issue when people are locked out of the market in the way that they are at the moment. So I think uh, that definitely will be the case that people won't want their property values to fall in value, right? Um, and I'm happy to help, but only if my property value goes up still. Uh, I'm happy to go at a slower rate, but it still needs to go up. Um, and so uh, what what other things do you think that, how is the government going to navigate that sort of soft landing of, you know, solving the pressures of society and the issues of growing, uh, you know, the, First time buyers and um, you know affordability. You know, do you think it's going to be bank innovation? Do you think we're going to see you know big densification? Do you think we're going to what? What do you think's on the roadmap over the next you know five ten years? Because you know a big part of this is also the rental crisis, right? They've gone and uh, you know blamed investors for eight years um, on the reason why house prices are, affo- are unaffordable. Uh, investors have left the market, and now we've got the worst rental crisis on history. You know, so. What do you think is going to be some of the solutions that they have to do? Yeah, I, th- I think that's another Im- impressive trend this year. 
um, is how the narrative has shifted on housing affordability. And increasingly, um, the like, yes, in my backyard, the YIMBY movement has yep. gained, has kind of come from nowhere in 12 months to be um, really at, at, at the forefront of all of these discussions. Um, yep. It used to be the case that a development was proposed and uh, media reports would be, and these brave um, locals are fighting against greedy developers who want to build, build homes in this area. Um, and now there's a bit of balance from, you know, generally younger people saying, actually, if this is a area that we are ever going to be able to afford, we need to be able to accept some development. Um, so that shifted, and also government policy has shifted. So we've seen um, in Victoria and, and New South Wales, in particular, uh, moves towards densification. Uh, there's there's a general recognition that, that that is the overall solution here. It's not just throwing more money in terms of grants or stamp duty concessions at first home buyers. Um, we need kind of more wholesale solutions, um, but. I do agree, um, Chris. I think that there's a lot of room here for innovation in the financial sense. Um, how can we lower that deposit burden for first-term buyers? The the twenty percent deposit kind of requirement that that fundamentally um, is comes through APRA. Basically, banks have higher capital charges for uh, loans that have smaller than twenty percent deposits. Um, that's something that was, I, I, as far as I'm aware, it dates back to kind of the 1970s when prices were significantly lower. Um, so I don't think that's kind of performing the role that it's intended to. It, what it's intended to do is show that if you are going to be credit worthy, you need to have shown that you can save a certain portion of the home before you get into the market. Mm. Um, I, I think that's that's probably a little over egged at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's at the margin there on financing, I think there's things we can do. But the solution here is to just Let's let people borrow more and more money. Um, the solution here is is working on housing abundance. Yeah. I mean, and obviously inherent in that is you have to be thinking about proper planning and creating good communities and environments and that sort of stuff rather than just whacking up lots and lots of shitty apartments, which we've already seen in many, many places. Because the thing is, and, and I guess in a way this gets to another article that you, well, you've written a, f a number of articles, but you have written an article about the shortage of homes um, and yet where supply is concentrated uh, isn't necessarily where we people want to live. And so there's sort of this um, argument that, okay, you've got to build more in order to make housing affordable. But if it was built and it was a nice place to live and it was built in a nice location where it's a nice place to live then and suddenly it's affordable – then people are going to go, yay, and then you're going to get heaps of demand and that's going to push up prices, right? So therefore, um, I sort of read your article about this this shortage of homes in, in the right locations and I thought to myself, what would happen if lots more homes were built in the right locations that were attractive, right? Um, but you also talked about a significant amount of well-located spare housing that policy changes could unlock. What do you mean by that? So there's so there's, there's two kind of parts there. So one is um, like where we build homes, and if we if we look at what's what's been approved uh, for development across cities, um, if we look at detached housing, particularly in case if we think about Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane in particular, um, they're they're very far from the CBD, which which makes sense. Where can we build new suburbs? They're, they're quite far away. Um, but it, but even if we look at um, higher density, so we're talking about Townhouses, you know, um, apartment blocks, yes, but also all kind of forms of higher density dwellings. Um, they also tend to be quite far flung, uh, particularly in Sydney, uh, less so in Melbourne and Brisbane, who have done quite well in uh, locating new homes close to CBD, where there are services, where there are transport links. Um, so, but is that is that really because of the cost of land, though? You know, it, like if la if the brownfield site or the the sort of infill sites are located in areas where there's high land values when it's residentially zoned, particularly if you've got high density there, then that automatically leads on to the cost to the, to the developer of the site is going to be higher. That's going to be a knock on cost to the to the the individual dwellings. You know what I mean? Like so, it's sort of. You know, it sort of stands to reason if you're going to create affordable housing, unless the government's chipping in some of the costs, some of the you know, tipping in some some of the money, that it, affordable housing is not going to exist in areas that are highly in demand. No, it's not. But the situation at the moment is that um, 
where development is allowed. So where someone could say an apartment block is a good good example. Where you can build an apartment block in Sydney is only really ex industrial areas. Mm. There's no there's there's very little scope at the moment for up zoning uh, any existing residential areas. So that narrows the number of available sites across the city to such such a small area where only um, really you know large developments can make sense for the developer and that's why you get those yeah. you know in certain pockets and and if you look at the development profile across sydney you get these pockets like ride like Parramatta, where you get really big um towers because there's very few sites and when they can get a site that, that you can do it you try and maximize um, yeah. the, the number of dwellings on there and what i think densification is as a concept um as i think about it is if you make um more areas across the city available to to be upzoned and not to the extent of enormous towers, but say, you know, three or four story or even just townhouses, you know, a three-story uh, townhouse um, amalgamate um, two or three um, large house blocks, um, but you do that everywhere. It means that developable land, developable land falls in price. More and more of these developments become um, become possible for developers um, and we're not just cramming. We're not just cramming people. You, you're either in a detached house on, you know, 400 or 600 square meters right next to a big tower. Uh, we're spreading that that burden out across the city too. I, I think that's um, that's kind of the the type of city that people want to live in. If we, if we go overseas, people love uh, places like Barcelona, places like Paris, where you see exactly that that kind of medium density profile across the whole city. But that's that's like built in a way that, you know, Barcelona is a fantastic example. You've got this really cleverly designed sort of hexagonal blocks, you know, and there's there's entire city blocks built that way. Um, whereas if you're talking about sort of the middle ring, you know, the missing middle ring a lot of people are referring to and thinking, okay, well, there's all these suburban house lots and maybe they're all 400 square metres or 500 square metres or whatever and a whole bunch of people band together and then sold them off to a developer did a row of townhouses, sympathetic with the, you know, fits in with the, the other houses, isn't it going to result in the remaining houses either being massively, I guess they could be massively devalued depending on the, the sort of the type of development that could happen next to them or massively increased in value because their scarcity suddenly, you know, their scarcity skyrockets. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't want to buy the, the – and so then the availability of those sites is going to go down because once again the prices are going to go up because for three – people with houses all next to each other to to bandy up to sell to developers, suddenly the costs go crazy because their land value's gone up. Is, is that a feasible, you know, like, I mean, do, is the only way around that to basically increase density or up zone so much that it becomes really unattractive to be one of those remaining houses? I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions. And you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. And there you'll find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, access to suburb help for investors, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower North Shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. If you're thinking about buying your first home, upgrading to a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly, get the finance right. Please reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Don't forget that you can download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room dot com dot I, I I think quite the opposite. I think um, this is part of the way that we sell this is that um, by upzoning, if you have a house that's eight hundred square meters and you're and you have the opportunity to upzone, you personally stand to to financially benefit from that because the value of your land's increased. But if your home gets sold and it gets made into three townhouses, um, the total cost for those three homes is less than it would have been otherwise. So we have you know, slightly s- smaller homes, um, but there's more homes. And, and that will, in general, push the average price for a home down, but the upzoning will increase the prices of, of those homes that can be developable. So um, I, like, I, I kind of see this as, as a win-win. Um, there's... At, at the moment, you don't have this like you've got to either have you've got to jump from an apartment that you can afford to a freestanding house, and there's not a lot in between there. And what if you don't need a whole freestanding house? Like, what if you're happy with a townhouse? 
um, there isn't that option. Yeah, there's lots of suburbs in Sydney. I think, say, you know, around Canada Bay, you know, Five Dot, Rod Point, those sort of suburbs where there's heaps of these, you know, original bungalows being knocked down and a mansion basically, basically being built in its in its um, in its place. So you can see that there's no heritage overlay in these areas. You can see there's obviously great demand to live in them, and I could sort of certainly see that if council had managed to to be a bit more forethinking back when they started allowing that to happen, you could you could see that that could have been uh, you know, a really great way to densify those areas. Um, one of the other things that I noticed in your um in your one of your articles, and tell me if I've got this wrong, but I sort of read it that you are say saying that a home builder, so that was our that government initiative that came out in COVID that to basically has led to the profitless boom for builders and a lot of people going broke. That by virtue of stimulating stimulating more house construction, as in single dwellings, individual dwellings, it's actually diverted trades, resources, et cetera, away from building higher density dwellings and thereby actually contributing to our housing shortage. That appears to be yeah, that that's a that's a simplistic reading of the data, is that we saw um, on first glance, um, throughout the COVID pandemic, obviously, if, if we if we think back to 2020, um, there were huge concerns about basically the economy cratering, um, and one of the easiest uh, industries to stimulate is the building industry. Um, and so, Home Builder was designed to keep people in the building industry in work, um, and it provided um, grants basically to build new homes and also to do renovations. Uh, but it was harder to yeah. Um, tick the boxes to get a renovation a- across the line to get the grant. Um, so it ended in a lot of um, detached building in new suburbs, um, but so much so that there's been huge capacity constraints. And obviously the increase in building materials costs that's happened throughout the pandemic constrained that as well. Um, but we've got this situation at the moment where, yeah, we boosted detached housing a little bit. Um, we've got, we had quite strong um, construction of, of detached homes. We've still got a lot under construction. I think um, something like twice as many as we normally have under construction. There's a lot of like half-built homes that are waiting for trades and waiting for materials and so on. Um, but both that uh, boom in detached construction, as well as um, the other thing that, that the government did to stimulate things, which was bring forward public works, so public infrastructure, um, diverted a lot of resources that could have been in higher density, um, the high density construction. We, we have had kind of quite a depressed amount of and units, townhouses, um, yeah. those kind of things being built. Now, that's not entirely the full story because, um, as, as we talked briefly about before, part of the issue with high density construction has been, um, you know, getting those projects off the ground in terms of financing. And a yeah. big, big input to that is getting investors to sign on the dotted line um, because mostly it's investors who are willing to say, yes, I want to buy an off the plan apartment that I'm not going to be able to see for three years or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, that's a key pathway to getting um, those projects built is getting investors in at an early stage. And that has been difficult really, um, really since kind of 2015, 16. Paul, what's your take on the, um, back to the last conversation around that heritage overlay? There's, you know, do you think that we should sort of just take this as a casualty of growing our city that, you know, the beautiful old heritage home on the great street in the trees and that tree, that beautiful street that's a hundred meter walk from the train station and is surrounded by lots of other streets of heritage homes that we just have to say these, this land's more productive for our city to, to densify. Um, and we just let go of the desire for keeping that architectural sort of streetscape, um, within, and we have to take down these homes to densify, or do you think heritage matters more? Like, there's that real battle, right? Because, you know, some of the areas where people want to live the most is where it's the most heritage overlay. So you think about low and offshore of Sydney, right? And and so what's your take on that? Like, is this just the way it is? We, we have to densify and heritage overlays don't matter. It's it's a really em- emotional um, argument for, for lots of people. Um, like, there are a lot of suburbs that are lovely and they're lovely because they are low density low, low density lovely tree lined um streets um and i think there has to be a balance um you know australia is growing cities are growing um and that's that's the reason you know part of the reason why australia has been so prosperous if we go back to the earlier discussion why has australia performed so well economically since the 1990s is partly because it's a young uh, growing country we 
we um, pulled in people from all across the world, the smartest people um, from from elsewhere. Um, if we're going to continue that, then there needs to be a balance in terms of of building new homes. And uh, where I stand on this is that we absolutely need to retain um, elements of heritage um, and the past and how homes have been built in the past is super important to that and how suburbs were in the past are important to that. But areas that are close to, say, new train lines um, and are well-serviced by schools, hospitals, roads, um, projects like that, um, then it's, that is where I would start that trade-off. I, I think it's I think it's a travesty to have a large single-family home that is 100 metres from a new train station when it could be, you know, uh, 12 apartments or three townhouses and have have young families in there and close to work and you know taking advantage of you know the Australia that people grew up with grew up with it's not the it's not the houses right it's the it's the culture and um all the amenity that we get from it's true that you know and i often though i walk through various older areas and you see some ugly red brick block of units or some horrible old 1970s sky rise and you think you look at the surrounding homes you think oh what they knocked over to build that so even though I don't live in one of those big grand old homes I still feel the loss of it so maybe I'm one of those sort of nostalgic romantic types although I normally would view myself as a pragmatist so I'm glad you think there should be a balance um there's also some of the research you've done, I thought was quite interesting as well. It seems to show that on one hand, households close to the CBD are the most crowded because um, you've got a lot of workers' cottages in these areas as well, right? But also the spread of spare bedrooms seems to follow this, the same pattern. So how can those two things sort of coincide? So can you, if I read that correctly? Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is an interesting feature of of the you know topology and and um, demographics of this of cities. Um, if you look particularly among renters um, or, or households that have not enough bedrooms, so what happens is everyone fills in the census and the ABS calculates well. Um, you know, there's four people in this house and there's only one bedroom. This is an overcrowded house, um, and you know it'll be people staying in the same room and so on and so forth. Um, and then by contrast, you'll have houses where it's a five bedroom house and there'll be two people living in it. Um, and so what we see is that particularly for, for younger households, there is quite a lot of uh, overcrowding. And, you know, you can think of a classic like uni share houses as an example here. Um, and, and where people choose to overcrowd houses are those expensive inner city um, areas. And at the same time, Due to the development profile, where we've got huge big bungalows that are you know five kilometers from the CBD, five, ten, fifteen kilometers from the CBD, we have a ton of empty nesters with three, four, five bedroom homes who are using one bedroom of their of the, of their homes. And um, on one hand, that's entirely fine. If if I'll, I think that people should be able to stay in their family home as as long as they um, as long as they want. Um, but at the moment, not only is there no incentive to downsize or to make those large homes available to kind of young families, you're disincentivized and, and you're mainly disincentivized by stamp duty because it'll cost you tens of thousands of dollars to to sell your home and buy a new one. Um, but it's also, there's, there's lots of other structural financial constraints. So the family home is not included in the pension assets test. So you can keep your pension, you can live in your four bedroom home on the lower North shore and, you know... There's, yeah. there's a huge financial cost for you to make those housing resources available to someone else. Um, so I think if we if we look across our cities, we've actually got a huge amount of housing that we're not using. So rather than having these these um, uproarious discussions about heritage and knocking over homes, we could just start to use the homes we already have in a more efficient way. And and all that requires is to make it easy for people to move to a home that suits their circumstances. Um, we've got yeah thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of, of spare bedrooms, and and you know, it's, again, it's perfectly fine to have a spare bedroom. But I think there's lots of people out there who, if it wasn't so financially disadvantage, disadvantageous, they would love to downsize, and that would bring down housing prices. Do you think that that's the the missing ingredient here? Is if we said, hey, no stamp duty if you want to downsize. I mean. It's not going to be very uh, politically popular <laughs> that you're no. giving baby boomers a free kick. Um, but there's a lot of other things that they care about rather than stamp duty. Like 
the pension, you know, as the, the home in the pension test, um, is there actually something they want to downsize into? Um, exactly. You know, are there townhouses, right? Are there bigger <laughs> apartments? And that stuff they want, exactly, and they want that in premium locations. You're not going to download stuff from a big house into something a bit tiny. Like, it has to be sexy, right? You've got the yep. kids well, involved they, here. They want um, to stay in the same area too. Same area. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, like and you've got to think about the inheritance here as well. Like, it's a bit, um, you know, the kids are watching their parents in their home. They're going, hey, mum and dad, why don't you stay in this home, like, for the next 20 years? Because I know that yep. money's coming to me rather than you downsizing, putting money into your super fund and spending it. Like, yep. um, I'm not, I'm, but that would be part of it. I, I do think there's there's that element as well where the, the kids want their parents to stay in their home and they, you know, they say, hey, we want to come here for Christmas every year and yours is the house that we come to. Like, so if that, that we're never going to got an apartment, right? And so do you think this downsizing thing and also the people are living a lot longer, right? Like even not even going to aged care homes because, hey, why don't you stay at your home and we'll bring care to your home. So yes. like, how does, how do we navigate this? Because it's, it's like they tried the 300,000 into super and I think that's just, it's not enough, right? Because uh, then on one side you're saying, hang on a second, you can only have so much in your super anyway before we tax you. So it's usually people who are usually on the more affluent area. So how do we get these downsizers to downsize? Because if you could create turnover there, and I'm sure REA are thinking about this problem, um, then you're right. You can get people to move up into these homes um, and then it creates much more homes for other people. Yeah, all of those, yeah, all of those family things matter. Um, people, if, if people should be able to stay in their homes if they want to. Um, I think my concern is that um, it, there's just so many disincentives. If people, if even if people want to downsize or want a more manageable yard, um, I, I think the the pattern of development matters here, right? If if suburbs have diversity of housing stock, like you say, right? If if a, a suburb is all single family homes. You've got nowhere to downsize to without changing location, and that's really important to people or staying is there in their own, communities. Is there only building two bedroom apartments? You know, or that, if there are yeah, in, yeah. Or if there's, you know, in some suburbs, you go from single family dwelling to one or two bedroom apartment. And those are your two options. And so, I think um, increasingly going forward, having that diversity of dwelling stock is is really important to give people choice. Um, and yeah, like no no one should should be kicked out of their homes by by any means at all. Um, I think what what we need to do is just make it a little easier um whether that is yeah concessions on stamp duty would be a big one i'm obviously as an economist very much in favor of, of land tax replacing stamp duty uh, because then if you're staying in your large home your large multi-million dollar home and, and you, it starts to actually cost you money because there's so much of that home that you're not using um that's one of the big things that will they'll push nudge people in the right direction that's all i'm that's all i think we need to do as opposed to putting a big barrier in front of people downsizing let's nudge them in, into the to doing a thing that's that's just more efficient for everyone <laughs> now one of the other things that um that you've written on which did surprise me and so on along the affordability side of things is that it's um you're saying it's cheaper to buy than rent in more than a third of cases across the country now i found that quite surprising especially given interest rates have been on the rise so what conditions need to be in place before buying is cheaper than renting? So what we did uh, for that analysis is we crunched, uh, so we, we, we've got an estimate at REA of the purchase price of every home in Australia, uh, and similarly, the current rental price of, of every home in Australia, um, and compared those two and, and kind of projected forward what happens as um, rents continue to grow at, at kind of not the pace we've seen because that pace has been very, very strong. Um, prices grow at kind of average pace of, over the next uh, few years. There's obviously lots of um, fixed costs of purchasing, stamp duty, and so on. Um, and found that particularly because of the really strong rent rises we've seen at the, the lower end of the market, um, we've seen rents for units grow quite quite a bit faster than for houses over the past year. Um, there's a lot of kind of units, for instance, and and um, entry level homes that are cheaper now to buy than rent. Um, now this this is part of the reason why. Um, you know, we're seeing investors come into the market. Um, and I think it also shows that there's a lot of people that are in, say, in a rental and would love to buy the the rental they're in, but are facing these kind of financial barriers, namely the deposit, um, to get into the market. Um, we're probably likely to see affordability conditions improve over the next year. I mean, particularly so if, um, if interest rates fall. Um, 
I'm not sure where my forecast for interest rates are over the next year, but are you game? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I was expecting at the you know until a few weeks ago, I was expecting another interest rate hike in in February. I'm, I'm less kind of certain about that now. Um, looks like the economy is kind of slowing in line with where the Reserve Bank wants wants it to be. Um, interest rate expectations in the US have changed markedly um, just just recently. It came down quite significantly. So um, yeah, we could be seeing interest rates fall late late next year um, in a, in an optimistic scenario. So that would obviously help affordability quite a bit. You were in the um, RBA, I think, for ten years, right? Um, what's your take on you know you've been out there for a few years? I said there's change of governor and blah blah blah, but and, and like a whole review and all that sort of stuff. But just internally, like, what's your take on what's happened over the last three or four years? And you know, what's going to be their mindset, you know, coming into, you know, a slowing economy, slowing inflation um, and rates being a bit contractionary, right? And housing affordability and housing rent, uh, home loan affordability, mortgage affordability is probably the, the thing that's really weighing the economy down. Like, is there going to be a real appetite to, you know, give that free kick back to mortgage holders on a significant way? Or do you think that even though they've gone up so fast, they want to they want to go down much slower. Um, or do you think their snapback's going to be quite big, and everyone's going to be surprised how fast they fall, rather than just as much as they were surprised how fast they rose. So th- there's been a lot of changes at the Reserve Bank, and and obviously I haven't been involved. Um, but I I think um, like revamping institutions like that are, that are so important um, is is a good thing. Um, the, a lot of the pushes towards are, are towards transparency and uh, more information being provided about how, how the RBA is making decisions, and I think that's all um, really welcome. Yeah. So the the challenge at the moment is, as you say, there's been a lot of change. There's um, your know, new governor, new deputy governor, uh, new head of um, your chief economist, um, a new monetary policy board that will start <laughs> next year. This is this is kind of everything all the way down to the top is all kind of a new structure. Um, so w- what does that mean for how the RBA conducts monetary policy? And uh, by and large, I would expect actually very little change in how the RBA tries to conduct monetary policy. Right. Um, I think they will try and be um, deliberate and um, pr- like slow in in the reduction in interest rates. Um, if the RBA does its job and and its forecasts perform okay um they will want to be reducing rates kind of as the economy slows rather than kind of ratcheting it down quickly um of course you know anything could happen we could see another big economic shock uh financial crisis of some kind and that would would necessitate rates falling quite quite sharply um but yeah i so far so good i think the economy is still performing really well we just saw unemployment rates just tick up a little bit um the, the RBA so far has done a really good job of of um, conducting its kind of you know soft landing, as, as, as which means that um, they have gotten the economy to slow without crashing the economy. Um, the economy is slowing, doesn't seem to be crashing. Um, importantly, people are staying in jobs, and, and really, if we're worried about say like housing risks and housing affordability, the biggest issue for housing affordability is all those people with mortgages making sure they still have a job. Yes, very important. <laughs> well, there's been, you know, and this is not really the topic for this discussion, but, you know, there was all the talk about the mortgage cliff that was going to happen in 2023, and let's face it, it didn't. And that's not to say some people have not really copped a hiding and really, really having a terrible time of it, but it hasn't transpired into this sort of avalanche of sales. And, in fact, total transaction, like you talked about, activity in the second half of the year was much greater than the first half of the year, but even so... Uh, I was looking at some core logic data that said uh, for at November that said something like I think 475,000 properties had transacted in the previous 12 months, if I've got that right. Now, there's plenty of times when I've seen that up to 600,000. So that's a lot less, significantly less. So that's about 20% down, isn't it, on what normally happens in a, in a given year. So, um, you know, that. There's definitely hasn't been a mortgage clear for a sudden sell-off when you when you're looking at total transactions so so small and also the current. I mean, we've got to understand transactions and listings are two different. There's there's stock levels, there's listings, there's transactions, 
but it's not like stock levels have been crying, uh, climbing and swelling. It's not like listings have necessarily swollen either. They're now back under the five-year averages. So uh, it is interesting just to to see that the market's been re- remarkably resilient. Resilient is, is I think, the best word. Uh, we've seen, yeah, listings increase second half of the year. Um, prices have kept, you know, have kept growing. So the market's kind of absorbed that that new stock that's come on the market, um, despite, yeah, higher mortgage rates, concerns about affordability and people selling out. And, and undoubtedly, there will be some people that, you know, it's been a really tough year financially for people. We've got um, really high inflation, putting pressure on all the things that people uh, need to afford. Um, rents are growing really strongly. Mortgage rates are up at the fastest rate ever. Um, in kind of that scenario to have, you know, the market performing well and the economy performing quite know, well. Go this figure. is all <laughs> Yeah, you know, taking a step back, this is a pretty good outcome given, you know, the the huge kind of real roller coaster we've had over the over the past few years. Paul, I mean, I think on that RBA research, uh, a lot of people were banding it around, you know, negative cash flows for forty percent of households and that's gonna cause all this forced selling. Like how have they got through this though? Like what like what means do you reckon? Like, because on those metrics, everyone would have said, oh, hang on, so 40% of negative households cash flow, that means they're going to run out of money in three months' time. They're going to have to start selling their, you know, their properties. Like, that hasn't happened. Like, why do you think that's the way? Like, what's what's the missing ingredient that a lot of people haven't factored in? Um, yeah. Uh, so, I, I did quite a bit of that analysis, actually, when I was at the Reserve Bank. And um, I think one of the big things is that um, households have had a lot of time to respond to um, respond to higher rates. Um, a huge number of households were on fixed rates, and that's although this created this cliff scenario where people were jumping from what was a very low rate to quite a high rate. Um, it meant that people knew it was coming. Right, you knew when your fixed rate was coming off, you had time to repair. Um, so you had that time to either uh, reduce your expenses or increase your income, whether that be like more hours or overtime or a new job. Um, also, we've seen the the income project the incomes that are, that that analysis was based on it was based on the incomes when people took out loans, and we know when people take out loans, it's it's usually when they're in that part of their life when incomes are growing quite quickly. Um, so people take out loans, they're having young families, they're kind of in you know in those most productive years of their of their working lives, um, and so just naturally their incomes have increased at, at faster than than average. So. People often, after four or five years into a loan, um, the, those those are the hard times. You know, if if you can get through the first five years of a loan, in general, you're going to be fine because your income's risen. You've paid down a bit of the loan. You can refinance. You know, to the the remainder. Um, I think that's the situation that a lot of households are in. A lot of uh, belt tightening. A lot of you know, looking at you know, am I is is my income where it should be? Do, are there other options for me? Um, but households are are resilient, right? People people are smart. People know um, people know what's coming around the corner, and and they've adapted. I think you're right. I call it the danger zone when people go the first time buyer that goes from um, quite a lot of cash in the bank account, you know, not being in debt for a number of years, uh, feel like they're totally in control of their finances. Um, yeah, going on holidays, you know, still saving, you know, living the good life, and then bang, there's 5000 left in their bank account and they're stressed when their first mortgage repayment is going to come out and how they're going to pay for the legal fees and um, uh, and, and, and trying to get through that danger zone and, and you know, sometimes doing the hard yards just after you purchase as you've done the hard yard savings as well. Um, because you're right, over time, you build a bit of equity, you get on top of your mortgage, your buffer increases, you get that wage increase, you didn't factor in the bonus, you... Um, and then you start getting on top of things and um, you start feeling more comfortable again. So I think you're right. I think it's that that danger zone. And I think families have been preparing for it. I think there was a bit of, oh, uh, people were just not thinking about their mortgage till it goes up. Well, I don't think that's the case. We've had clients come to us for you know multiple years now when my fixed rate's finishing, what's my repayments going to be? I think they're leaning on family more than ever. I think families are helping them out with mortgages um, and repayment. They you know, that extra thousand is keeping him in their homes. And that's a good bet for the parents and grandparents. Um, and they, so, yeah, I think they've got other resources. They've got other assets. They've got savings. They've got, they can sell their car. They, they're doing things that they're taking second jobs. Like, you know, they're not just selling their homes. I think that surprised a lot of people that um, just assume that high mortgage repayments are going to lead them to rush to sell. 
So yeah, it's a bit naive, isn't it? Have you got a proper Dumbo for us? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I do. I Excellent. do. Um, ah, this is a good one. Uh, this comes from, I was, I was speaking to an agent um, and they were exasperated uh, and saying that it was, uh, who was it? Someone, they were, they were, they listed their home, uh, weren't happy with the price because uh, they were, they had been reading the papers and said, hey, well, Sydney prices are up, you know, 8% over the past year. My, my property should be up. Um, and they, they were in the central coast and, and central, the south central coast is part of the Sydney area. Um, and the central coast obviously went through a huge COVID increase and, and it's been moderating a bit. Um, I think, I think things are still performing okay there, but, but not as, as strongly as, as Sydney, um, inner Sydney in, in particular. Um, and so they had anchored themselves to, to Sydney prices. They were, you know, expecting their, their home to also have gone up. They went, I think, dumped their agent, got a new agent, listed the property and then, Listed it with the new agent, dumped that agent, went back to the original agent. So kind of just you know wasted a huge amount of time um, because they didn't basically get get the data. Uh, look at your local area. How's your local area? What are what have um, nearby homes been selling for? Nearby similar homes. Um, it's all that information that that really like you know an agent that's that's their bread and butter to help you out with. Yeah. Um, but not not being. Yeah, being a bit more precise in in what your um, comparison is. Your expectations. The other thing too is that, you know, if they said, well, mine should have gone at 8%, you know, over the year because Sydney prices have, and then th- what, what's to say their realistic expectation or their expectation of what it was worth a year earlier was, oh, it's realistic <laughs> in the first place. So it's 8% on already inflated expectation. Paul, well, yeah. it's been a, a great chat. It's always interesting to get into your mind. So we really appreciate you coming along and, and sharing uh, your knowledge with us. And uh, we hope to get you back again a little bit quicker than the last time. I think it took a bit long. So we shall certainly want to get you back again and talk to us again uh, later oh, in the year. I can't wait. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Fantastic. Paul. Cheers, mate. Excellent. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our amazing guests have to say.